This is a thematic review for the social theme. Here's some basic components of what we're talking about when we look at the social theme. And here's the review slide for the first unit. So one thing to remember in the Paleolithic era is that those hunter-gatherer societies were relatively egalitarian, meaning uh, there was no social hierarchy and people had equal roles. The whole society was consumed with finding food, essentially, and this was seen as an equal task for everybody. And because there was no surplus of food or other important goods, there was never an elite class that formed. During the Neolithic era, that starts to change as societies begin to settle down because of the development of agriculture and pastoralism. When I say settle down, of course, with pastoralism, I just mean develop more sophisticated uh, social organization. So we have specialization of labor, meaning people have certain tasks. This person's in charge of farming a certain crop. This person's in charge of producing clothing. We do have a surplus of goods, which means some people have more than others, and we get the beginning of an elite class and also the development of patriarchy, as men take on what are perceived as more important tasks than the ones women are doing. So by the first six civilizations, um, we do have clearly stratified hierarchies. There is competition creating even greater social stratification. In these new developing political systems, power is concentrated in the hands of the elites. And so in all of those civilizations, both states and in city-states, we get the intensification of social hierarchies. Now you'll write a main idea statement for Unit 1. For Unit 2, we have, again, the Classical Era. One thing that is developed here, remember, the major there are major religions and philosophies that developed during the Classical Era, and they sometimes affected gender roles. Confucius was a patriarchal thinker. Filial piety means obedience to your family, and under the Confucian philosophy, that means the father figure. So you might remember the three obediences as an example of a woman kind of um, subverting her will to that of the male in her life. And one development that happened as Buddhism spread into China and the rest of Asia is, uh, remember in Buddhism, it's frequently the way people practice it is to leave society and join a monastery. And many women chose that path because there was more freedom allowed to them as you know, Buddhist uh, uh, believers than as residents of a uh, kind of home front. For these major empires like Rome and the Han Dynasty, uh, the social structures are very hierarchical. There's a list here of jobs at the beginning. Usually the uh, peasants or laborers or slaves are at the bottom. There's an exception in China, which is that the merchants were considered of a lower class than the peasants. Make sure you remember that that is unusual, which is why the book pointed it out. For the same reasons as in the first period, patriarchy will continue throughout this time period, although as I mentioned earlier, sometimes it is reinforced by cultural beliefs. As these empires expanded and began to exert their authority over a wider variety of people, there were social tensions created. When you concentrate wealth in the elite class, sometimes that resentment boils over. And an example of that in China is the Yellow Turban Rebellion, which you might remember, by the way, was inspired by Taoism, which is sort of an opposite philosophy of Confucianism, which would be much more comfortable with concentrating wealth in the hands of elites. So now write a main idea statement for Unit 2. For period 3, 600 to 1450, um, one of the things that governments did was use traditional sources of power like patriarchy. Another thing to remember is that these structures were shaped by class hierarchies. This is a continuity. In pastoral societies, they tend to be less gender oriented than agricultural societies do. Because pastoral societies are on the mood, move all the time, we have a little bit more of a connection to what I had mentioned earlier about pa the Paleolithic era and the hunter-gatherers, that women are seen as fulfilling a more vital role for survival, whereas in agricultural societies, as women are taking care of the home, it's perceived as being less important. So there is a persistence of patriarchy, but in some places, such as the Mongol Empire, women did exert more power, and women were very highly regarded as important 
components in the social organization of Mongol society. So gender relations were affected by cultural diffusion. So as these belief systems that are listed here spread throughout Afro-Eurasia, they begin to challenge thinking about gender roles. So now write a review statement. I'm sorry, a main idea statement for Unit 3. Okay, so in period four, there is some restructuring that happens with the slave trade. Uh, did make demographic changes happen, particularly in Africa, as predominantly men are removed from African society. As far as gender roles, women have more responsibility in the society that the men were taken from. So from a social hierarchy standpoint, you might want to review these note card terms in the Spanish American colonies in particular and also the Portuguese American colonies. These are racial classifications that also had social hierarchy stratifications in that Creoles, for instance, were higher status than Mestizo or Mulatto. Now write a review statement, a main idea statement for Unit 4. So uh, industrialization, again, is a huge change in all aspects of society. So we will see some restructuring of social hierarchies, as such as new social classes. In industrial societies, a middle class develops. In the places where that is very strong, that tends to eliminate or at least repress social unrest. So you have fewer revolutions and rebellions in a place where the middle class is perceived as attainable. So a, a lower class worker will get the message that if they work hard, they can kind of rise up to the middle class. According to Marxist philosophy, the workers who are referred to as proletariat, that's kind of a history word you might need to know, do not have that opportunity. And so we see communist revolutions in societies where workers did not see an opportunity to move up to a middle class. As women are increasingly working in factories, as we see here, that will change gender roles, and that leads to the beginnings of the feminist movement. It's one of the causes of feminism. Another big one in the 19th century being the abolitionist movement. A lot of women were involved in the movement to abolish slavery and took the same principles upon which that movement was based and applied it to gender roles. We do have a racial component to imperialism. Uh, social Darwinism, remember, is taking the natural selection scientific theory of Charles Darwin and applying it to human society. This diagram or series of pictures here, of course, is completely inaccurate scientifically and morally, but it was used to justify imperialism. And that's kind of an important thing to recognize in terms of how it was that European societies that were based on enlightenment democratic principles could subject uh, colonial subjects to such horrible treatment. Uh, so the Enlightenment and society. Expanded suffrage means the right to vote is granted to more people. Slavery is going to be abolished, which of course is a change in social hierarchy, as is serfdom. And these are all ideas based on Enlightenment principles of individual liberty. And the Reform Act of 1832 in England, shown on the right here, remember extended the right to vote to more people. So as feminism emerges, it of course challenges gender hierarchies. So you had a couple of Things to remember, Mary Wollstonecraft and Elizabeth Cady Stanton as being early 19th century um, figures in the feminist movement. And global migration, which we'll also talk about in the economic theme, of course, in, changes the role of women in societies where men are leaving for work. The women left behind have more responsibilities in those societies and may, in, of course, do more labor themselves there outside of the home. And if women migrate, they are needed to provide for the family in their new home and their new labor system. Now write a mean idea statement for Unit 5. Okay, last unit, globalization in the last 100 years or so. One of the important components of the feminist movement as it advances in the mid-20th century is the... Um, advent of birth control that women can control. So something like the birth control pill, for instance. And when a woman has control over whether or not she has children, that's an important component of giving women the uh, freedom, I guess you could say, to make their own decisions about which path they want their life to take. Especially after World War II and the leadership of the United Nations and, of course, the aftermath of the Holocaust, 
The idea of a basic set of human rights to which everyone is entitled became more popular around the world. The United Nations uh, did release a document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which essentially is a statement of enlightenment principles of individual freedom and self-expression that are expected to be granted to everybody in the world. And women's rights would be a part of that movement. Now write I mean idea statement for unit six. And that is your overview of the social theme. Happy studying.